Jimmy Hoffa disappears. A girl named Squeaky takes a shot at America's interim president, who, on another matter, tells New York he won't help in its financial crisis. So Mayor Abe Beam attempts to generate public pressure with a rally, Lenny Bernstein directing. The Mayagüe is recovered, but Saigon falls, two years after America's formal withdrawal. The crush of Vietnamese trying to leave with the Americans, another sad chapter in the Vietnam story. The U.S. and Russia make space history with the Apollo-Soyuz link-up. And President Ford congratulates them all. Women get more and more of their rights, including the right to be as ridiculous about male bodies as men have over the years been about the female form. Well, it is International Women's Year. In Houston, Texas, there's little Miss Charm. Ain't she cute? And then there's Reverend Ike, the money madman of the cloth. Primal Scream is a fad of the time. There's trouble in the Spanish Sahara. Pat Moynihan rails at the UN. Franco is dead. Jackie mourns her second husband. Patty Hearst is arrested. 1975. Saigon. The peace agreement signed in early 1973 didn't end the war, though American troops pulled out. Thousands of refugees streaming into Saigon from the north bring tales of humiliating losses as the North Vietnamese move south. They take the central highlands, then the coastal cities, Hue, Da Nang, Quang Nai, Nha Trang, all fall with hardly a fight. South Vietnamese officers panic, abandon the troops, and run. Frightened soldiers and battered civilians, all in flight, first to what they hope will be the safety of the South, then finally to the last outpost, Saigon. They find shelter of sorts, but no real safety. On April 29th, Saigon Airport falls. The city is surrounded. Thousands scramble for a way out. At the U.S. Embassy, they try to scale the barricades. Marine helicopters pluck from this sea of humanity the Americans and thousands of South Vietnamese leaving other thousands at the mercy of the city's newest invaders. Those left behind watch the conquerors roll into their city. Shortly after noon, on April 30th, 1975, the flag of the provisional revolutionary government is raised at the presidential palace. A signal that a century of Western influence in Vietnam is dead. South Vietnam's General Duong Van Minh goes calmly with his captors to announce unconditional surrender. President Chu's successor, Big Minh, headed South Vietnam for only three days. The fear and near despair settle in, but the bloodshed is ended. Commerce resumes, and new flags go up everywhere. Not all are surprised at the takeover. A new hope begins to flower. Many of Saigon's three and a half million feel that anything is better than the fighting. The new government erases all evidence of the old regime. This monument, depicting South Vietnamese soldiers going into battle, was called the Liberty Statue. Liberty has a new meaning now. A costly war. What's to be learned? CBS newsman Walter Cronkite. Uh, Vietnam, by, by having established at great cost, 55,000 American lives, to say nothing of the billions of dollars, which is part of the cause of the present economic crisis in this country, uh, and their weakened uh, economic position around the world for the U.S. dollar, uh, 
a great cost, but even at that cost, uh, what we've come out of this with is the fact that I don't think any administration for a very long time to come is going to commit the United States to a foreign adventure uh, without being pretty darn sure first that the American people support it. But within days of Saigon's fall, there is trouble in Cambodia. At my direction, United States forces tonight boarded the American merchant ship SS Mayaquez and landed at the island of Koh Tang for the purpose of rescuing the crew and the ship which had been illegally seized by Cambodian forces. They also conducted supporting strikes against nearby military operations or military installations. I have now received information that the vessel has been recovered intact and the entire crew has been rescued. 38 men die, 50 are wounded. As we approached, we could see a number of Ameri what we thought were Americans waving white flags. We ordered the boat alongside. We uh, asked them if they were the crew of the Mayaguay. They cheered and yelled and said, yes, they were, and we welcomed them on board. We actually found very little when we boarded. The, uh, the enemy had, in fact, gotten off of the ship. They'd gotten off in a hurry, left their breakfast. Now, I imagine the reason they got off was we had gassed the ship prior to arriving there, and it was uh, somewhat of a sight to see an American destroyer pulling alongside. I'll tell you, you're one of the finest, most heroic pilots I've ever known in my life. And a lot of my guys owe their lives to you, of course, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna forget it. Henry Kissinger had warned, there are limits beyond which the United States cannot be pushed. In outer space, the U.S. finds dealing with other nations somewhat more serene. U.S.-Russian cooperation reaches new heights on July 17th with a high-flying form of detente some 140 miles above the Atlantic. It's the hookup of the American spaceship Apollo and the Russian spaceship Soyuz. There's a slight shudder as the two ships come together. The two halves of a common docking system engage. Contact, shouts American skipper Thomas Stafford, switching to Russian for, we have succeeded. The Russian skipper, Alexei Leonov, said in English, well done, Tom, it was a good show. And so it was. There is a slight delay when the Apollo crew detects an odor, tracing it to a small furnace in the tunnel. But the problem is quickly handled and soon, it's handshaking time all round. In his phone call to the spaceship, President Ford tells them, a momentous event, a very great achievement. Not only for the five of you, but also for the Soviet and American scientists who have made this flight possible. Well, back to other problems, while the astronauts and the cosmonauts have a space lunch and exchange gifts. Maybe a peaceful link up in Berlin someday. How would you describe the Teamsters Union? Well, all big unions uh, just like big business. They're corrupt. Our government's corrupt. What are you going to do? It's, it's the way the country is. At least it's free. We don't have communist control here anyways. Jimmy Hoffa's wife, Jo, waits for her husband. It's the day before Christmas, 1971, and President Nixon has commuted Jimmy's 13-year sentence. No, I believe it. No, I believe it. How's it feel, Mr. Oh, right. wonderful. Very good indeed. Hello, so away. Will Jimmy run again for president of the Teamsters? Well, after being uh, 40 years in the labor union operation of the Teamsters Union, however, I do not intend to break the conditions that will be established and I'll work from within to see what can be done about it. 
He took over the union in the mid-1950s and made it the biggest one in the world. But the charges of arch enemy Bobby Kennedy finally ran out of court appeals and Hoffa went to jail. And then it happens. My father, James R. Hoffa, has been missing for some 32 hours. He left for an appointment at Max's Red Fox restaurant at approximately 1.30 p.m. Wednesday, July 30, 1975. He called home at approximately 2.15 p.m. We have not heard from him since. At the present time, we have no information as to the present whereabouts of Mr. Hoffa. We have no information that he is living or dead. I think uh, as of, with the passage of time, I think it's quite conceivable that there is a little feeling that uh, maybe there's uh, a possibility that he may not resurface again. The search for Hoffa, or his body, goes on for months as one tip or another comes in. Some involve one-time mafia associates, men who supported Hoffa's rise to power, but did not want him as the boss again. While in jail, Hoffa was convinced the man he'd left in charge had conspired with the White House to prevent his heading the Union again. This man is Charles Chucky O'Brien, a foster son to Hoffa, and yet a suspect. Another suspect is tall, curly-haired Joe Giacalone, a friend of Chucky's. But the questioning comes to nothing. He's been made the object of a great deal of of antagonism and accusations, unfounded, baseless accusations. And I think that it would just be inappropriate at this time for him to try to put himself in a position of defending himself, because I don't think he should be defending himself. He's got nothing to defend himself about. My personal opinion is that Mr. O'Brien has no more idea what happened to Mr. Hoffa than you or I do. I'm, uh, I don't know wh who done it, but I imagine he's got a cement jacket in the bottom of the Detroit River. The FBI finds another kidnap victim, one who learned to fight for her abductors, and she's arrested. Hauled screaming from her apartment in February 1974, Patty Hearst, then 19, is taken by gun-happy terrorists of the Symbionese Liberation Army, and she told authorities later, kept drugged and terrorized for weeks in this closet. Tortured mentally and physically, she says she joined the SLA in fear for her life. Whether willingly or unwillingly, she did help in the infamous bank job two months after her abduction. They scooped up more than $10,000. In tape-recorded messages, Patty announced to the world she was now loyal SLA member Tanya, named for a woman who aided Che Guevara. Patty says later she was being closely watched during that first bank job by Sin Q, Donald DeFries. The black ex-con and SLA leader dies with five other SLA members in a shootout with the FBI in Los Angeles, Patty barely missing that shootout. She hid, along with William Harris, his wife, and another SLA member, Wendy Yoshimura, a Japanese-American artist. Patty seems defiant. Asked her occupation at the jail, she lists urban guerrilla. Randolph Hearst and his wife know many trials in the 19 months of Patty's capture. But now the trial is Patty's, on charges of bank robbery, assault, and the kidnapping of a youth in Los Angeles. Convicted in 1976, she is sentenced to seven years in prison, serves part of that time, but is granted executive clemency by President Carter in 1979. The Harrises, arrested with her, get 10 years for Patty's kidnapping. Was this the real Patty Hearst, or was she fighting for her life? The FBI conducted a long search for Patty, or Tanya, she may still be searching. Patty Hearst, heiress or terrorist, or both? Do American presidents take too many chances? It's three years since George Wallace was gunned down, when Gerald Ford, leaving the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, hears a shot and ducks. A bystander jars the gun. Ford dives out of sight as Secret Service men jump into the crowd to arrest Sarah Jane Moore, a graying 45-year-old mother of a nine-year-old. A close call. The bullet misses the president by a few feet. Lynette Squeaky Fromm had tried two weeks earlier, but the gun of this one-time follower of Charles Manson failed to go off. Both women get life sentences under a federal law passed after the assassination of John Kennedy. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, 
widowed a second time. Aristotle Onassis, the golden Greek, is dead. He married Tina Lovanos in 1946 and had an affair with opera star Maria Callas before marrying the president's widow in 1968. Ari's father was a prosperous tobacco merchant. The Greek-Turkish war wiped out his fortune and Ari, at 16, went to Argentina. He worked nights at 25 cents an hour, built up a tobacco importing business and made his first million by 25. In his late 20s, he was buying freighters and tankers for the shipping business that made him a jet-set multimillionaire. His heirs are Jackie and his daughter Christina, second from left. A son, Alexander, died in a plane crash in 1973. His fabulous yacht was named for daughter Christina, who always had a special place in Ari's affections. Jackie, with her son and daughter, and Ted Kennedy. Again, the center of attention at the death of a husband. American graffiti, kind of, you know, the movie. Well, people, you know, you, you figure out, you know, what are you going to do Wednesday night? Go down to Van Nuys Boulevard because there's a lot of people and, you know, everybody just does it. I was cruising Van Nuys Boulevard with another friend of mine, a girlfriend. It was September 21st, uh, 1959. And I just bought a brand new 59 T-Bird. It was the second night I had it. And, uh... We were about halfway down the boulevard, and this little Nash Rambler pulled up alongside, and the gals tooted. We tooted the horn and pulled him over. We went to coffee with him, and, well, we got married. tickets for, you know, wide tires, tires sticking out beyond the fender wells, your exhaust too loud, uh, no horn, you know, anything you can find. Uh, well, I was on the boulevard uh, then, uh, you might say driving up and down in my car, uh, being seen by others, and uh, now I'm driving up and down the boulevard on a motorcycle, being seen by others, and also I'm looking at others as I was then, but only in a different light, you might say. They sit on the corner here, and they do nothing but bother the customers coming in and out. They fight and they wrestle in our parking lot. Oh, throw paper all over it. They send tow trucks, police cars, you name it. They've sent them here. Cruising on Van Nuys is a time-honored tradition. And as you can see, it's running or cruising stronger than ever. The boulevard is named for Californian Isaac Newton Van Nuys a big grain farmer in the 1870s. He sold his land for a fortune so that L.A., the sprawling metropolis of the future, could sprawl a little further. to happen. Imagine women looking at men as sex objects. It's male go-go. I think it's about time to have something like this for women. It's our turn now to enjoy it. Male go-go is a box office success in city, town, and hamlet. The boys make a hundred dollars a night. This is their big chance and they're just really going crazy. Well, these women are too much. It's just a lot of fun. It's hilarious. It really is. The so-called dancers are really truck drivers, mechanics, salesmen, moonlighting, or spotlighting. I think it's fantastic. There goes the old butter and egg money right into the old bread basket. Uh, or something. Altogether, I brought in $47.25. 
three propositions. What in the world do they propose? I average about 10 a night. The liquor control board in one community rules the boys have to cover their nipples with pasties. It's the law. That's the way to go, Tanya Parker. In Houston, Texas, females are still the performers, though these are the youngest ones. There are about 5,000 beauty, charm, talent contests for little girls, with seven big-time contests, a growing trend in recent years. Little Dee Dee gets a few on-the-runway tips from Mama. Look at the judges. That's most important. And smile. We just kind of, Dee Dee, practice your modeling. Dee Dee, practice your modeling whenever we feel like she might do it. Of course, okay. she does one thing at home when she gets out on stage, and she does another thing. You don't do that. She started when she was two and a half. So, really, she's improving a lot. She used to just get out there and stand, and I just pray for her to get off the stage, because... <laughs> Tell me, what is your favorite television program? Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Popeye and Rocky the Flying Squirrel. I like to watch Popeye. Do you have any hobbies? You know what a hobby is? Do you have any pets? Pets. Pet? Any dogs or cats? I don't have any dogs or cats because I'm allergic to them. Oh, Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'd like to have another talk with y'all again. In the La Petite Division, Christy Galloway! Christy Galloway! The moms say they do it all for their little darlings, but some psychiatrists are skeptical. Isn't she gorgeous? Well, it keeps the kids off the streets. And yes, the mothers too. <laughs> it's a stressful decade. One victim, like many of us, with tensions, anxieties, hurts. This man has found a method of coping. Here in California, hundreds search to find a cure for their neuroses through an evolving kind of therapy called primal scream. Talking about a patient, the one who ignited his interest, is the founder of primal therapy, a psychologist, Dr. Arthur Janoff. Young man, and I asked him just out of some whim of mine to call mommy himself, and he refused for about 15 minutes, and I finally got him to do it. And uh, much to my surprise, he was on the floor writhing and screaming and yelling and went on for about a half hour. And when he got up, he said, I can feel again. And I thought that was a very extraordinary event, but I didn't make much of it. Uh, and I, it happened again about three months later. I tried it on the patient, and the same thing happened. And at that point, I knew that I was on to something and that I'd better get down to work and work out some kind of theory, and I tried it on dozens and dozens of patients after that, and over the next two to three years, worked out a theory and a therapy called primal therapy, um, based on this kind of very uh, simple model. What you see here now, you probably won't believe, happens every single day at the Primal Institute in Los Angeles. Almost every day there are groups, eight, 10, 12 therapists working at a time, helping patients into their feelings. It's unlike any other group therapy in the history of psychology. It's based on a simple idea that people should not confront each other in group therapy. They should confront themselves. Dr. Janoff on the beach at his center on the Pacific. What we really do is uh, you're reliving these scenes, 
so that you can finally connect them to consciousness and get rid of them once and for all. And when you get rid of the pain by reliving it, then you get rid of the tension that that pain produced. <laughs> I was 30 years old before anything good came into my life. And Christian science taught me it was my only mother and my only father that I ever had. And it taught me, it taught me how to be honest. And it taught me well, that there was truth. And it taught me to look into myself. And it brought me here. And what I realized is, is that it was the, the why I never talked about it is because I didn't want to give it up. Because it was the only brother I ever The um, man uh, is having a primal about saying goodbye to religion, as it were. Religion was his... Uh, companion, his friend, and really all he had in life. And now that he's got himself, he finds that he needs it less. And if you're wondering about religion and what happens, many of the people do eschew, get rid of their religious background, as it were. Very few patients end up religious. And it's not because of any ideology that we place in the patient's head. It's simply that they find they no longer need symbols. One more kind of therapy in a growing arsenal of psychological techniques. What primal therapy does is lead the way in the revolution, the personal revolution, because it's man's final resolution of the tyranny of his neurosis. And what we try to do is overthrow his neurosis by force and violence. And you see that in the group. Tremendous force, tremendous violence, because we're yanking feelings, you know, out of an unreal structure. But it's obvious to me from watching neurotics that no sick system personal or social, it gives itself up voluntarily and easily. It has to be fought with, struggled with, and finally overthrown. Another sick system, New York City. For months, it teeters on the brink of bankruptcy. Mayor Abe Beam is hopeful. New York's tradition of leadership are fighting back, are finding the answers. That's one of our gifts to America. It's in that tradition that we're facing up to the financial crisis confronting this city and state. We need your help. I know you're going to give it. Thank you all and God bless you. The city will need more than God's help to get out of this mess. New York needs $500 million a month to keep its head above water. The city is forced to take a hard look at itself. Its bureaucracy is overwhelming. One civil servant for every 23 citizens. Many departments are inefficient. Managers don't necessarily manage. Workers don't always work. For years, the city has spent more money than it earns, borrowing to pay its bills. So New York asks the feds to bail it out. Gerald Ford's reaction? A very firm no. Not until the city first does something to help itself. Ford's stance outrages Governor Hugh Carey. I'll fight now is to place these facts and press our case before the Congress to get a bill that gives us time to bear our burden, to pay our debts, and cure past mistakes, and to fight this reckless experiment with public insolvency which comes from the President. We want time, yes, to tighten our belts. Mr. Ford proposes, indeed, to put a noose around our necks. We will not accept that fate without a fight. The city's welfare costs are also part of the problem. Over one million people on welfare. More unskilled workers migrating to the city all the time. If I heard the president correctly, he's only concerned in making sure that fires will be put out because maybe people will ride and that the police will be there to lock them up if they arrive, but he's not concerned as to whether uh, the uh, people who are on welfare is going to get a check, and I, and I don't I don't think they're going to sit still for that because they have to eat. I don't I don't know of anybody who uh, doesn't have to eat. Yes, people must eat. Those on welfare depend on the government for survival. If the cuts are made here, what would happen to the people? They're not putting anybody on. For 
she is, here's another lady that... And I'm putting anybody here. on because of what's happening to the city. They don't know if they're going to have money to give the people. So how can I put anybody on? In fact, after the chance, after the payroll, we don't get your, your check. Before the chance, you don't get nothing. Don't ask me what the people with, with, with children and things. I, I, I don't even know what all the people are going to do. And then, okay, at least you said, maybe we know someone will give us a sandwich. What about people with kids that need milk and... Yeah. What do they do? We got no water, we got no heat. We're freezing to death in there. Look, there's no city, man. We're dying. No welfare cut. So, what's next? Well, when in doubt, sing the national anthem. New Yorkers are defiant. They say Ford wouldn't dare let the city sink. But the president is determined. He'll not bail out the city. So, back to the drawing boards. Bureaucratic budgets are slashed, workers laid off, wages frozen, but the welfare checks are paid. In the end, Ford rewards the city's self-help program with help from the Treasury Department. The city has learned what the poor have always known. Poverty has no class. They could have skipped the whole crisis if they'd listened to the easy answers of the Reverend Dr. Frederick Eicheron Cotter, also known as Reverend Ike. I say there is no virtue in poverty. There is no honor in poverty. There is no style in poverty. Poverty doesn't have any class. Money loves me. Money loves to fill my hands. I have been tuned in and turned on by the teachings of Reverend Ike. Money loves to go into my checking account. Oh, he's wonderful. Like, you gotta see him not as a man, but you know, like a helper. Cause that's just what he does. Money loves to serve me. To pay my bill. Look at this church. <laughs> the church, once an ornate movie palace, was renovated at a cost of $2 million. Ike has class. His six homes and 26 cars are mere tokens in evidence. I have experienced poverty at just about every level. I see you're looking well. As a matter of fact, I've experienced poverty at uh, certain levels that I don't even yet like to make public. And uh, I made up my mind in those days that poverty was not my bag. At last, one minister who practices what he preaches. Ike's annual income is estimated by one source to be $15 million. The United Christian Evangelistic Association, of which I'm president and founder, is successful, prosperous, and rich. It is a multi-million dollar operation, and I make no apologies for it. I rejoice because of it. Remember the words of Jesus, seek you first. First, what? The kingdom of God and what? And his righteousness. And what happens behind that? All these things, Cadillacs, Fine homes, good clothes. I say all of it. Money won't buy happiness, but it does ease the pain. I am so glad all is mine. Niagara, the most spectacular falls in North America. From the time the first white man discovered it almost 300 years ago, it's been a place of excitement and adventure, of lovers and honeymooners, thrill seekers and daredevils. Hundreds of those daredevils have challenged the incredible power of Niagara. And some of them were lucky.
Back in 1859, the French aerialist Blondin walked a thin wire 200 feet above the swirling water. There were thousands of gaping spectators, even the Prince of Wales. Blondin was easily bored, so he would add some new gimmick each time. A bicycle, a blindfold, a somersault, a sack over his head, even manacles on his hands and feet. And few performers know so well what it's like to have a manager on your back. Blondin inspired many imitators. Signor Bellini leapt into the river. Maria Spelterini, the first woman, did it with peach baskets on her feet. School teacher Annie Taylor started a new trend, over the falls in a barrel. Six others tried to duplicate her stunt. Only three of them survived the test. The days of the daredevils were numbered. Police and firemen on both sides of the river, tired of risking their necks to rescue Niagara nuts, said no more. They were busy enough recovering the accidental victims. But somehow, back in the autumn of 1972, entrepreneurs get permission to launch this excursion ride. Outboard motors powering rubber rafts, rafts carrying 40 people per trip. The cost, $20 a head. Now this is when you relax and say, I'm going to enjoy it and let it go. <laughs> the only thing you can do is relax. <laughs> relax? The current in the Sea Thing Whirlpool Rapids averages 35 miles an hour. Hardly a Sunday outing. Definitely not for the meek or the timid. Whatever happened to going to the movies for a bit of excitement? Buckle up your life jackets, hang on tight, and cross your fingers. Here we go. Nineteen seventy two's raft rides are finally forbidden when the passengers one day go for an unexpected swim. Yet in nineteen seventy five, a ride just like this one is being tested again. This story has an unhappier ending. Hit by a huge wave, the one ton raft flips over. Three of the passengers die in the swirling waters. Why do people take such foolish chances? There for a short while, I really, truly thought we weren't going to make it, that we were going to flip right over. There's just no way to get around it. I was scared. I really was. Fantastic. Just, just fantastic. I don't know what, what else to say. It's just a good ride. Real nice. I was very disappointed in that. I thought it would be a lot scarier. But the whoosh, yeah, it was. It was beautiful. You can get held up in the beauty. That's why you forget the danger, really. Beauty? Oh, yes, that's in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Chaim Herzog, Israel's ambassador to the UN, has good cause to scowl. The United Nations has just passed a resolution that equates Zionism with racism. It's only a piece of paper, yet the resolution makes anti-Semitism more respectable. It starts about a year previous. That's when Palestine Liberation Chief Yasser Arafat speaks at the UN. His presence is a milestone. Since then, the Arabs have advanced their cause, using oil and money to get the third world votes they need to pass the 75 resolution. Ironically, many countries who vote for the resolution do themselves practice racial discrimination. Says Herzog, uh, you only have to look at the Arab propaganda today to see that they are the vilest anti-Semites in the world today, anti-Semites in the sense of anti-Jewish. The Arab reaction? That's not true. People here confuse between Judaism and Zionism. What was condemned here 
in the General Assembly was Zionism as an exclusivist concept in which only Jews are accepted. If you ask me what, what is your assessment and appraisal of the 30th session, which you are concluding today, I will tell you, frankly, it is a session which is characterized by confrontation, mainly triggered off by the United States new policy, engineered, implemented, architected by the new ambassador of the United States, none other than Professor Money. The vote equating Zionism with racism was a shocking untruth. And it's not true. It's a lie. That's the point. Not that I don't like it, you know, uh, you know uh, it's just not true. And yet it has become, has acquired the status of an international pronouncement. And an organization that keeps doing that is going to find its reputation considerably diminished in the world. Pat Moynihan's point is well taken. American support for the UN slips even more. The resulting discord damages not only the search for Middle East peace, but also the very principles of the UN. In my view, it is the beginning of the end of the UN because nobody can really take it seriously. And it's a tragedy. Well, we mustn't hold you up. Right, thank you. Bye. Margaret Thatcher's campaigning pays off when she wins the leadership of Britain's Conservative Party. She'll go far. Well organized, sharp-witted, some say she's just what an ailing party and country need. How did she bulldoze her way to the top? Well, I didn't set out to be leader in any way. I didn't plan it or determine to do it from my youth. It's just the way things have developed. Uh, I've gone on at each stage, first a member, then a parliamentary secretary, then a minister, tackling each job and, I think, getting on top of it. And then the last election campaign was very, very interesting. I took perhaps a more prominent part in it than I'd played in others. And whether it was discussing tactics or strategy, or in the handling of the morning press conferences, it did just pass through my mind that I could cope with it every bit as well as any one of my colleagues. And I've always believed that when opportunities come, you should take them, and you should use the abilities and talents you've been given to maximum extent, and should stretch them. And you've got a duty to do so. Oh, say, can you see? People breathed a sigh of relief when Jerry Ford became president. Anything was better than Nixon. Then came Jerry the Clown. As one reporter said, when the Russians thought Kennedy was a clown, they put missiles in Cuba. This time it might be Long Island. Jerry fumbles the punchline of his jokes. He trips over his own two feet. Grist for the mills of cartoonists and of comedians like Mark Russell. I'm a cartoonist, a verbal cartoonist. I have to draw word pictures. With Franklin D. Roosevelt, it was the, the cigarette holder. With uh, LBJ, it was the 10-gallon the hat. With, with Jerry Ford, I, I think it's, it's the Band-Aid. <laughs> I think we've established that. The, uh, the uh, various, uh, the, the miracle of being able to go to China without once tripping over the Great Wall. That's, that's what we're into with uh, Mr. Ford now. Some say anybody can become president of the U.S. Others say that's just what happened. Just a regular guy, he's an inspiration for Chevy Chase. Politicians, by and large, are people trying to sell themselves to us over the use, through the use of the media. And uh, we got the medium of television, and we can use it just as well. And we figure, hit on anything that uh, we think is a little... Off. It's it doesn't, it doesn't Chevy says all's fair in love and politics, and his producer, Lorne Michaels, agrees. They're complaining any more to me than a bucket of fish. I mean, it's just a word. It's rhetoric. Right, they're just... Uh, they're he just, wasn't elected. Uh, the man vetoes everything that the Congress, who has been elected, gives him. No, no, Chevy, don't... He has, he has no right. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry, Lorne, but I've got to get it out. All right. Also the thought in the back of your head that this man who stumbles and knocks over the podium is running the country. 
Given the choice between knowing the fact that the man does stumble or not knowing the man does stumble, as in the case of the last administration, I'd prefer to have somebody making jokes about somebody stumbling if indeed he does stumble. Chad, I think that was brilliantly put. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. No, I think you're right. <laughs> and by you too. It's a problem for his image makers. Sure, as a campaign manager, it worries me if somebody's laughing at the President of the United States. You know, that's not the traditional way to get votes. On the other hand, I just have a feel, and everybody I talk to uh, thinks that this will run its course, and, and we're getting a lot of sympathy because, again, there's no truth to it. One more time, Jerry. First you give the cone to the aide, then you salute. 1975. Whoops.